In all my travels throughout the universe, I have battled against evil, against power-mad conspirators. I should have stayed here, the oldest civilization, descendant, degenerate, and rotten to the core. Power-mad conspirators, Daleks, Sontarans, Cybermen. They're still in the nursery compared to us. Ten million years of absolute power. That's what it takes to be really corrupt. Hello and welcome back to the Doctor Who Marathon. I'm your host, Makida, and today we're going to be talking about episodes 13 and 14 of the Doctor Who uh, story, Trial of the Time Lord. This segment is known as The Ultimate Foe, with episode 13 being written by Bob Baker, who sadly passed away before he could finish it uh, due to a liver failure. And episode 14 is written by Pip and Jane Baker. Um, after a, a big dispute uh, behind the scenes, we'll get onto that. And it's directed by Chris Clout. This story concludes the, um, the season-long story arc, The Trial of the Time Lord. And uh, a lot of behind-the-scenes issues was um, buried in through this story. The original idea is that Robert Holmes would be the, the core of the, of the writing crew. He wrote the first story, The Impossible Planet. And he was supposed to return for the end of the story. And he wrote, um, I think he wrote the majority of episode 13. But when episode 14 came along, he only had his notes and he sadly passed away. Eric Sigwood then uh, decided to uh, take up the writing duties and keep in as close as he can to the notes. However, one of those notes that Robert Holmes planned was that the story would end with the Doctor and the Valyard falling into the Matrix in an eternal struggle. However, John Nathan Turner really didn't like this idea, thinking that it could uh, be a massive risk for the programme and gives um, studio heads um, a reason to cancel it. And so he rejected Eric Saywood's um, script. This means that Eric Saywood and John Nathan Turner really weren't getting along. And it's here that Eric Saywood decided he would retire from script editing duties. And so Pip and Jane Baker were asked by John Nathan Turner to return to writing duties. However, they weren't allowed to look at any of the original scripts or plot points. And as well, um, the Eric Saywood's lawyer had to look at the scripts just in case there's anything that might um, infringe on Eric Seawood's script. So basically, they had to write a script um, based off another script which you haven't seen or uh, read, and somebody would then come in and see if they were too close together, and if, and if they were, then the BBC could get sued or asked you can you not do that? So this puts this story in a very awkward situation behind the scenes. And for what it's worth, I think it is actually a cracking uh, story to end Trial of the Time Lord. It might be a bit disappointing in a lot of elements, but for what it's worth, I think this is a very good outro to this particular era. It's also important to note that this would be Colin Baker's final televised story. He was supposed to return for um, season 24. However, Michael Grade basically called up John Nathan Turner and said, you either um, cancel the show there and then, or we let you continue and let you keep Doctor Who, but you must fire Colin Baker because of all this controversy around it. And sadly, this meant that um, the idea was to originally have Colin Baker return for the first four episodes of the next season, but he refused. And so the regeneration um, had uh, Sylvester McCoy in a wig and, um, and his regeneration, the Sixth Doctor's regeneration, kicked off the start, right at the very start of the next story, um, Time and the Rani. However, thanks to um, adventures like Big Finish, we were allowed to continue the Six Doctors' adventures. So anyway, is this story 
uh, let's delve into the story. After the conclusion of Terror of the Vervoids, the Doctor is now uh, set up for trial against genocide. However, um, uh, the, inquir the, the Inquisitor asks the Doctor for uh, the only way to disprove that the, uh, that the Matrix is lying is so that um, is to get witnesses. But the Doctor's like, I can't get witnesses. Of course I can't. You know I can't. All my friends are scattered throughout space and time. You know I can't. All my friends are scattered through space and time. And it's here that two pods um, arrive onto this uh, space citadel, uh, the space station, and come out of these pods is Solomon Glitz from the uh, mysterious planet and Mel, uh, uh, Melody, short for Mel, um, from Terror of the Vervoids, the Doctor's future companion. And they actually step into the trial where nobody knows where they came from, at least uh, anybody in the trial. It's a complete shock to both the Doctor, the Valyard and the Inquisitor. However, it's revealed that the Master has gotten himself into the Matrix, proving the Doctor right in that somebody can get into the Matrix and alter it and change the facts. And, um, and the Master basically explains that he's helping the, um, the Doctor for uh, a particular reason. It's here where the Doctor asks uh, Solomon Glitz what, uh, what was in the information. Uh, what was uh, the information hiding about Ravelox and stuff. And it turns out that it's um, the whole, the information where it came from and the reason why Earth was destroyed by a fireball, moved thousands of light years away and was renamed Ravelox was because of the Time Lords. They were afraid that somebody would um, reuse this information and so they basically destroyed Earth, renamed, set it light years and renamed it Ravelox. Uh, which is kind of a plot point which doesn't ever get mentioned again, which sounds like a really important um, really important point, uh, plot point. Uh, anyway, uh, so the Doctor uh, basically has this massive speech and it's probably Colin Baker's most iconic lines. It's the one I mentioned right at the start where he compares Time Lords to mad conspirators, Daleks, Ontarians and Cybermen. Um, and Colin Baker brings out his, his soul. He brings out his this is the doctor whose tether is now completely broken. He is sick to death to Time Lords. And he is like, um, this is purely mad. The Time Lords are absolutely villainous in this story. They are the villains. And the master agrees. The master um, basically explains that uh, the High Council of the Time Lords took advantage of the doctor's uh, blunder as they popped out a future incarnation to, to organise all this. Um, he points to the Valyard. Um, they made a deal with the Valyard, or as I may know him, the Doctor, uh, to distort the evidence and put this trial to basically hide the fact that the Time Lords were doing it. So this entire trial was a farce to get the Doctor... Um, to blame the Doctor for something he didn't really commit. It was to basically hide any evidence of their commitment to this idea of Ravelox. And it is here where the Sixth Doctor clicks. Wait a minute. Did you just call him the Doctor? Yes, Doctor. He is uh, a sonification of all your darker selves somewhere between your twelfth and final incarnation. The Valyard is a future evil incarnation of the Doctor. This is incredibly fit in with this storyline, in my opinion, and it really sums up the great um, storyline of The Trial of the Time Lord. The Trial of the Time Lord is about a man, the Doctor, 
trying, he knows he has done wrong. He's known he's, um, he's uh, brash and he knows that he's not always in the right. But he wants to prove that he's a better man. He even gets clips from the future to prove that he does become a better person to his friends, to his companions, and uh, to the situation of the universe. However, it all comes crashing down as the Doctor has to come face to face with his future that proves that he is not going to turn good. This is a evil incarnation that... Um, is the Doctor's future and basically says to the Doctor, you are not going to become good. You're not going to get better. You're not going to be self-improved. You are going to uh, keep with your uh, instincts, with your, your evil, your, all the bad sides of you, and they're going to manifest into this regeneration. And it shocks the Doctor to his very core. And I really love this idea. I really, really love the Valiard in with that idea. Sadly, it doesn't go that far with it. They state that he's like an evil incarnation of the Doctor, but nothing really delves deep into it later on in the story. The, in a very um, silly scene, in my opinion, because the geography really works unless the Valiard has... Um, super speed. Um, he gets past the Doctor and Mel and lands into um, the seventh door of the Matrix, which allows Time Lords to go into this Matrix, a world without logic and without um, any basis in reality, where it's basically like a giant, like um, uh, virtual uh, computer. And so the Doctor taking glitz with him. Um, travels to this uh, into the Matrix to try and find uh, the Valyard as well as the Master who is still in there, and um, and so the trial. Everybody in the trial, including Mel, goes back into the courtyard to try and work out what's going on and watch the events unfold. And they also talk to the Master, who basically explains that uh, the Valyard did um, alter the truth. He did. Um, tamper with the evidence and um, when questions were asked he, the, value, uh, the master basically states that there's a lot of truth in it however some of it is a lie for example and I really hate this bit Perry didn't actually die and she is now happily married with Brian Blessed's character that I think really hurts Mind Warp and it's one of those things where I honestly don't care what the show says. Perry died. It takes away from that dramatic ending and the theme of Trial of the Time Lord. And it, thinks, and it really hurts the overall plot and it hurts Mind Warp. So in my opinion, uh, in my uh, fan theory, shall we say... Um, the master was just basically lying. But anybody of you who are interested um, might learn that Big Finish actually made a few audio dramas that feature the Sixth Doctor and Perry after Trial of the Time Lord, where the Doctor picked her back up and now she's a more mature woman. And they have adventures with each other, continuing adventures with each other. I don't know if it's ended yet, uh, I believe it's still going on in terms of when I'm recording this, uh, which is October, if anybody's interested. Uh, but, yeah, I personally really don't like her idea. And in my mind, the Master was lying and Perry did indeed die. Um, and so the Doctor and Solomon Glitz, who basically becomes the companion in this story, um, go into this... Uh, I think it's like an Edwardian, Victorian, uh, strange uh, world where uh, they have like a fantasy factory and they go in there to try and meet the Valyard. Uh, but there's this whole strange thing that's going on where there's like multiple of them. And 
I'm not a huge fan of Chris Clout's directing, I will admit. He's not, I don't think he's a particular strong director in Doctor Who. I think maybe he prefers producing because he was, he's mostly known for producing uh, The Bill, a British uh, drama about uh, police officers. Uh, but I will admit, I really did enjoy this story in terms of its appeal, uh, in terms of its visual appeal. And I think the majority of that might be its twisted, warped reality. I'm one of those, I will admit, I'm a sucker for stories set outside of reality where uh, we can have some really obscure, surreal ideas. For example, uh, the Doctor's in like this waiting room, but he pushes forward because he's tired to talk into this one character, only to find himself back in the same room um, with that character like there. So there's like multiple of them and later on like he tries to talk to try and get to uh, the Valyard and it's like okay you must wait in the waiting room but as soon as the doctor opens the door for the waiting room he finds he's in on a on a beach with no glitz and he hears the Valyard laughing and it's like you will die doctor you will have I will take all your lives as hands um from the bottom of the sand, grab the doctor's legs, pulling him in, and uh, the cliffhanger for part um, for part thirteen of the tri part one of the ultimate foe has the doctor screaming help as um, as he gets sucked into the sand, and that is actually a really good cliffhanger. I really like the scenes in the Matrix, and it really plays with this uh, idea of of it's n not real. As in the next story, which is kind of a cop out, Solomon Clitz tries to save the Doctor but fails, only to be revealed that the Doctor is unharmed and that he basically explains that this world doesn't exist, it only exists in the mind. And so, because the Doctor denied this reality, he denied the Valyard the pleasure of killing him. And it's also here that the Valyard appears talking to the Doctor one to one. And we get a sort of explanation onto what the Valyard is. He is an evil incarnation of the Doctor's future. And his, uh, I think he states uh, at one point that um, he's there to steal uh, the Doctor's remaining regenerations. However, that only comes into one plot point. So, uh... And what we learn about Doctor in the future does, uh, doesn't add up to that. And it's my belief going, watching his story, I think it's a bit clear that that wasn't really his intention, or at least not his main intention. Uh, really, he basically hates all the virtue of, uh, of the Doctor, his, um, all the goodness, the stuff that stops him from uh, saving people and... Um, altering the facts to uh, to his advantage. So think like letting Adric die. According to the Valyard, he should have gone back and saved him. Uh, Genesis of the Daleks, he should have gone and destroyed the Daleks there and then. And he believes that going back in time and destroying um, the idea of the Doctor uh, at an earlier stage in his life would mean that the Valyard is free to be this version of the Doctor he's always wanted to be in terms of uh, and the evilness of the Doctor. And that uh, this incarnation of the Doctor, who's very sensitive to things, which allows him to get into outbursts and stuff, made him, out of all of his previous incarnations, an easy target. And that's why he picked the Sixth Doctor. Not because... It just so happens in the timeline, not because um, of just any sort of wibbly wobbly. It is because the Sixth Doctor, he, he felt like in terms of all the Doctors that he could fight, the Sixth Doctor would be the one he could easily take down. That says a lot. This is a Doctor which would be the most tempted to go to the dark side, if you will, 
Um, this is a doctor who is most likely, out of any other incarnation that we've seen so far, maybe it doesn't really add up when we consider uh, retroactively any future incarnations. Some people might even argue the next incarnation, the seventh doctor, would be more likely to be um, a villain. Um, maybe, that, maybe that still adds up. Who knows? Um, and the sixth doctor is basically... In the Valyard's mind, uh, one of the incarnations of the Doctor in which he can feel like he can manipulate the most into pushing the Doctor into a much more ruthless incarnation. So anyway, uh, later on, uh, the Doctor and um, Solomon Glitz get saved by the Master who's planted his TARDIS in the Matrix. And he explains that um, the Valyard it's such a ruthless incarnation. He's basically been stopping the master as soon as he even like sets foot anywhere. And the master is basically fed up of the Valyard and wants him to be destroyed. And so he's helping the doctor because the doctor is the most likely incarnation and a most likely chance that the master has to stop in the Valyard. He's, as the Master basically explains, which I don't think really works when you think about it. Um, but, any, but basically what the, the, what the Master explains is that with um, the Doctor in his usual incarnations, he, the Master always had a chance that he could beat the Doctor, a chance that he could uh, be victorious. But with the Valyard incarnation of the Doctor, I mean... The Valyard title was only really for the court. The, the Valyard himself calls himself the Doctor. So really he's just the evil Doctor. But it's much more convenient just calling him the Valyard. Um, according to the Master, the Valyard... Um, th there is no chance that the Master can be defeat the Valyard. With, without the Doctor's uh, kindness and compassion um, hold, holding him back... Basically, the Master has no chance, and so he's trying to help the Doctor to defeat the Valyard. Or, uh, best case scenario for him, is that they take down each other, leaving the Master f um, basically killing two birds with one stone. And it's here that the Master basically sets up a ploy as he hypnotises the Sixth Doctor as, a, as bait, leaving uh, the Doctor out. Uh, in the middle of the courtyard to to try and get the, the Valyard to come out of his uh, base of operations. But the plan seems to fail as uh, the Master, uh, the Valyard, can throw these feathers which explode um, and he throws them at the Valyard and glitz. And so um, the Master comes up with another plan to get glitz to help the Master, uh, to help the Doctor. And at this point, the Doctor sees Mel out from the distance, who calls her, calls him back uh, into the courtyard. And when they go into the courtyard, um, they they re-examine the the ending of Terror of the Vervoids. And Mel goes, "Yes, the Doctor did um, kill all those people out of genocide." And so the, the the court finds the Doctor guilty and allows the Valyard to take his remain in regenerations and the doctor first along goes along with it it's then revealed that this court was actually still in the part of the matrix and the real court are watching this and mel is like this is absurd we can't just let him die and so she kicks she kicks the keeper of the matrix's key takes the key and goes into the matrix herself trying to save the doctor before he is sentenced but he tells uh, Mel to basically go away um, but when Mel basically reveals that uh, this is all a ploy um, that wasn't the real trial does um, all the guards and the carriage the doctor on disappear and the doctor gets frustrated with Mel as he knew that the trial was a fraud he knew that the trial wasn't real but he wanted to basically continue it so that he can have um he can quickly have a confrontation with uh, the master, uh, with the Valyard, sorry. Um, and they also reunite with 
Solomon Glitz, to which they go into um, into the meeting rooms again, um, whilst the Doctor and um, Mel get taken to the Valyard's base. Um, Glitz actually finds this information that um, is the master tape of what he was looking for in the mysterious uh, planet. That was a duplicate and this is the real genuine article as data banks of information on technology and um, science. And so he goes to the master to basically sell it. However, the master accidentally triggers a limbo something and the last time we actually see the master in this story is that he's trapped in his own TARDIS um, as uh, reality is warping around them. Uh, this would be the last regular appearance of the master. Um, Anthony Ainley had appeared in every season of the John Nathan Turner era of the show, at least for well, at least one or two stories uh, per season and this would be the last time the last in um in a line of stories it would appear again until the final classic doctor who story the survival but uh yeah uh that's a shame uh so back to the doctor and uh mel they go into the his base of operations and the the secretary firstly is like uh, I'm sorry I can't seem to find him and the doctor's like don't worry uh, tie him up um, and they tie him up and the doctor takes off uh, the sixth secretary's like fake face it's a mask revealing itself to be the Valyard and the doctor finds a machine there which is basically um, a bomb and the Doctor works out that the Valyard doesn't trust the Time Lords to help their hell, their side of the bargain. And so what he plans to do is assassinate all of the High Council of, of the Time Lords. And so uh, the Doctor tries to figure out what's wrong with it. Uh, first send and Mel, tell Mel to go back to the courtyard and tell everybody to... Um, to hide and escape, be prepared because there's going to be an explosion. However, the Doctor can't figure out the machine and so he destroys it. This angers the Valyard as, um, as the Valyard's like, you can't. Um, you've destroyed the mechanism. It's now going to destroy random bursts of energy and to which it does, destroying the room of the courtyard. Um, but luckily nobody gets harmed. And the Doctor runs out and the Valyard first tries to fix with it and he couldn't. And so uh, the Valyard collapses onto the floor, presumably uh, dies. Although, as we would later know in audio drama, he survived this encounter. And so uh, the Doctor goes back to the courtyard, uh, tells everybody like the, the, the trial's all over, um, the Valyard has been destroyed. Uh, the trial deemed that the Doctor has been redeemed, that um, all charges against him are, are gone, they're, re they're made redundant. They also explain uh, to the Doctor that Perry lives, which again, I'm not considering because that's really stupid. I don't care what anyone says, um, Perry is dead. And then I think something really interesting happens. This would be the Doctor, the Sixth Doctor's Colin Baker's last moment as he tra travels with Mel, his future companion. Does nobody see the issue here? The Doctor's travelling with his future companion and nobody brings up this fact. Like, the Sixth Doctor acts like she's just a regular companion. What the hell's going on? We also get the um, iconic last lines of the Sixth Doctor as he cries out um, carrot juice, carrot juice, carrot juice as uh, Mel, this exercising nut, uh, basically explains um, that she's going to put the Doctor back on a routine of exercising and make him drink uh, carrot juice to keep his health up. 
A uh, really funny bit is um, the doctor considers, after hearing this, actually, you know what, I think I was, um, I think I was rash into denying the, how, into becoming the president of Gallifrey. And he starts heading back before Mel stops him. It's like, come on, doctor. Um, so, yeah, um, that's the ultimate foe. Um, overall, it's a bit of a mess. Uh, clearly, there was a lot of issues in terms of plot points. And I will admit, the majority of the plot is mainly just the Doctor and Glitz just experiencing this weird, surreal world. However, I will admit, I am a sucker for these kind of storylines. And personally, I really enjoyed The Ultimate Foe. It's got a lot of great character beats and moments. It sums up the, the whole idea of Trial of the Time Lord with the Doctor um, battling himself on whether he's a good man or not. And I really like the premise of this story, the whole uh, Into the Matrix and the, the trial elements in here are actually woven into the narrative. However, there is a lot of issues. The whole concept of the Valyard is really confusing to understand. And it really, and I think what's the worst thing about it is that it really doesn't delve into um, the real idea of what the Valyard could be. As the Valyard, um, for the majority of the plot, is a really, really moustache twirling, ha ha ha, Doctor, you can't defeat me, kind of villain. Michael Jason is probably one of the best actors um, of any Doctor Who villain, in my, uh, my opinion. In my opinion, he is the best Doctor Who villain performance. But, and it really works, and him doing a moustache twirling villain really does work. However, he is a moustache twirling villain and the whole concept of him being the Doctor does kind of get shoved to the side in a lot of scenes uh, to bring out a more traditional baddie. Um, but yeah, the Master returns in a very fun uh, role even though it's a very small part. Solomon Glitz is a lot of fun. Um, Mel, who is my least favourite, my least favourite um, classic Who companion, though watching these stories, uh, I don't think she's as bad as I remember her. Uh, she does, she's very proactive, she likes to get into the adventure rather than other companions who um, are more in it for the sightseeing basically and the villains and the monsters are just a... Um, just uh, like a side effect of that. Um, but luckily in this story she doesn't have a lot to do and she's only and she's really akin to a side character in this story, not really a companion. Now for those of you canon heads out there, uh, in my opinion what you should do is if you go on YouTube somebody has made a fan animation of the start of the audio story The Wrong Doctors which um, shows the Sixth Doctor right after this story taking Mel to Pease Pottage, her home, uh, hometown. And the Sixth Doctor basically leaves her there for his future self to pick her up. And so uh, that little clip ends with the Sixth Doctor travelling by himself. And that will leave you a massive door to have um, audio struck audio drama stories where he's traveling by himself and have some new companions. And so there you go, that's the ultimate foe, the last televised appearance of Colin Baker's Sixth Doctor. Um, I hope you enjoyed that. So join me next time where we go back to the Gallifrey audio dramas as the Inquisitor in this story makes an appearance. So join me next time for the Inquiry. I'll see you next time on the Doctor Who Marathon. Ta-da!